Marvel's Midnight Suns is not only one of the best games of 2022, but it's one of the best tactics games I've ever played. Released in December, it went largely overlooked in discussions about Game of the Year 2022, which I think is a big shame. In this video, I want to show you why I think Marvel's Midnight Suns is incredible and why you should play it now in 2023. Marvel's Midnight Suns is essentially two games in one. On the one hand, it's a card-based tactic role-playing game. Think of Fire Emblem meets Slay the Spire meets XCOM. And on the other hand, it's a role-playing social simulator with Marvel characters, kind of like Mass Effect meets Persona meets The Avengers. I'm a big fan of all those games and I consider myself a casual Marvel fan. So when I heard about Marvel's Midnight Suns, I was very excited. It's not perfect and it doesn't do everything equally well, but I do think it does each thing well enough that fans of any of the games that I listed and Marvel fans will find something that they can enjoy here. Developed by the makers of XCOM for Raxis, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this would just be XCOM with Marvel characters, which in some ways it is, but it's also different on so many levels. Having listened to multiple developer interviews, I think I can see why they had to make it this way. XCOM with Marvel characters wouldn't have made sense. You'd not expect to see the Hulk taking cover behind a wooden crate or Iron Man's missiles only having a 40% chance to hit the enemy, for example. So there are key differences here that Firaxis had to bake into this game, ways in which they had to make it different from XCOM. The most obvious being the card battle system, which we'll go into more detail on later. But other things like the fact there's no cover or accuracy system, or how every card that you play hits, or the lack of a movement grid. Hero movement on the map is essentially unlimited, as superheroes are naturally very mobile, being able to fly or even teleport. Firaxis have developed a strategy RPG to suit the fantasy of playing as a group of superheroes, and I think that's really interesting because they had to come up with clever ways to make you feel powerful when playing as, for example, Captain Marvel or Scarlet Witch, but also to stretch your tactical muscles and still have each battle feel like a puzzle that can and has to be solved. The way they managed to do this is impressive, and I'll explore this more later when I talk about gameplay and the card-based battle system, but fundamentally, while XCOM is about survival against the odds, Marvel's Midnight Suns is about winning as quickly, efficiently, and in as flashy manner as possible. Then there's the other half of the game, which takes place back at your home base, which is called the Abbey. Some similarities here to the monastery from Three Houses are quite obvious. It's in the Abbey that you take control of a character called the Hunter. The Hunter is a new creation for this game that you can use to customise and play as either a man or a woman, with full voice acting and a backstory that's crucial to the main overarching plot. In the Abbey, you'll engage in conversations with heroes, develop your bonds with them through activities called Hangouts, and explore the grounds of the Abbey doing side quests and discovering objects of lore. It's also in the Abbey where you discover upgrade cards and modify cards for your, for your heroes, build their decks and craft items for battle. Everything that you do in the Abbey feeds into the tactical card battles in some way, and there are very few things, if any, in the Abbey that feel extraneous or tacked on. It doesn't feel like you're just sort of running aimlessly from shop to shop. Marvel's Midnight Suns is a huge game with lots to do, taking around 40 to 60 hours to finish depending on your playstyle. It's a game that wears its influences on its sleeve, and Firaxis have definitely tied together systems from several different genres and games in the battle and in the Abbey to make a game of two halves come together for something imperfect, but something truly special. So let's discuss performance, technical issues and bugs. I played this on a PS5, so unfortunately I cannot comment on Xbox, PC or Steam Deck performance, and we're still awaiting a Switch release which is coming later this year. I'm curious to see how the Switch will handle this, as having played on a PS5 where performance is mostly good, it can sometimes chug. I can see the Switch struggling with this one. On PS5 I experienced multiple frame drops during battle, especially during big flashy attacks with lots of particle effects on screen, which in a game with superheroes like Captain Marvel happens quite frequently. This was somewhat surprising to me as the game is not particularly eye-pleasing, with quite low detail textures and character models, and simple map design and geometry. One area which I think does look quite good is the Abbey itself and its surrounding areas, which kind of impress graphically and give a kind of gothic sensibility and atmosphere when you're exploring them. In terms of bugs, I only had a few. The most egregious was when an enemy fell through the earth and became untargetable, but he continued to attack my characters, and another when the screen went black and I had to play a battle without being able to see anything at all. Other than that, there were some minor graphical glitches, including one involving a main character's eye twitching, characters clipping through each other during cutscenes, and some enemies going into T-poses. Now let's talk about combat, deck building, and progression. So you pick three characters to take into each battle, and each character has eight cards which combine to make a 24 card deck. In story missions you have to use the main character, and in side missions you can use anyone you want to. Each turn you draw your hand and play three cards, although there are ways to play more, and you can redraw a couple of cards if you aren't happy with what you got. Once you use a card, it's cycled back into your deck, and once you've finished your turn, the enemies will get their turn to attack. 
There are two types of cards, ones that generate heroism and ones that cost heroism. You can think of heroism a bit like mana. Some heroes are better at generating the other heroism than others. Overall, there are 11 playable characters at launch who all feel distinct with individual strengths and weaknesses. They can be broadly grouped into tank, damage dealer or support, but this is flexible and when you're putting your character decks together you can tailor it. So for example, you can make your Spider-Man a damage dealer or you can make him more of a crowd control support character using binds and environmental effects. And the roster is as follows. Blade, he specialises in single target damage, chain effects and bleeds over time. Captain America, his ability is all about generating lots of block, taunting enemies and drawing cards. Captain Marvel, her abilities are similar to Captain America's but she can also go binary. This gives her increased block and damage. You can do this after you play three of her cards. This makes her, in my opinion, slightly worse than Captain America as she's kind of dependent on this to be good. Doctor Strange, his abilities are mostly support like drawing cards, making your team invisible, buffing other attacks, generating heroism. But he does get a few good damage dealing attacks of his own. Ghost Rider, he specialises in high damage at the cost of self damage, creating drops on the battlefield that you can push enemies into and sort of chaining attacks as well. Hulk is a tank who deals more damage the more he's attacked. He's a character that's unlocked very late and by then you kind of have your regular team worked out anyway. Iron Man is a kind of hybrid who can tank, deal damage and support. His abilities are upgradable during battle and he can hit multiple opponents at once. Magic is a damage dealer who can reposition enemies and uses knockback for single target damage. Nico is more of a support damage dealer who generates heroism through spells and random effects. She's not my favourite hero as I quite like to plan my attacks in advance and her random effects kind of negate this. Scarlet Witch, she's a magic support with buffs and some area of effect damage dealing. She's not as good as Doctor Strange and she's unlocked quite far through the story as well and it requires quite a bit of effort to make her feel good. Spider-Man, he's more of a crowd control attacker, he can bind and chain attacks. Again, he's not the strongest character but the flavour of his attacks is excellent. The Hunter is the main character and the character that you create. He's the best character in the game in terms of abilities on the battlefield. He has 30 cards that you can choose from compared to 10 for everyone else. You can build him in any way you want. Healer, support, attacker and ultimately he or she will carry your team. Wolverine is an attacker slash taunter who specialises in lifesteal and chaining attacks together. And there's DLC to come in the form of Deadpool, Venom, Morbius and Storm. The cards themselves are well designed and have good flavour when it comes to each character. And the effects that go with these are often very visually pleasing. I'll never get tired of watching Doctor Strange's spell animations or watch Blade leap into the air and take down an enemy in slow motion. Cards have keywords like taunt, lifesteal, bleed, which are self-explanatory. One keyword which is crucial to how Marvel's Midnight Suns is designed is the keyword quick. In each mission there'll be certain enemies that don't have a health pool and die in one hit. Cards that have the quick keyword are refunded after they knock out an enemy. So the way that you play th more than three cards in a turn is to use quick cards and knock enemies out. This is where the strategy and puzzle solving come into play because you have to work out which cards, which heroes to use to knock out these quick enemies essentially. And it becomes very satisfying when you can line up multiple heroes in a row and instead of just playing your three cards each turn, you can end up playing four, five, six cards while drawing a new hand. Like card plays, movement is also limited. You can only move your hero once per turn, although like card plays there are other ways to increase this. There's no movement grid in Marvel's Midnight Suns and I think that's a good thing. It wouldn't have made much sense to have a movement grid as heroes are able to fly and teleport. It wouldn't have made sort of story sense for heroes to be limited to moving two or three spaces on a grid. Movement is still very important strategically as there'll be environmental hazards which can affect certain parts of the map. For example, a missile will be landing on one part of the map so you have to kind of work out where to leave your heroes at the end of a turn. You can also use your heroes to knock enemies into each other and certain hero attacks have cones of effect which you need to line up. In addition to this, when you're on the maps you can interact with environmental objects on the battlefield to do damage to enemies, like knocking over lampposts. The objectives of each battle are different and don't just consist of kill all the enemies. They range from things like survive a certain amount of turns, to destroy a helicopter before it takes off, or rescuing civilians trapped on a bridge. There's a star rating system in the game. You're awarded one, two or three stars depending on how many turns it takes you to complete a mission and how many heroes died. This is part of how the developers have tried to refocus the strategy compared to something like XCOM where the game is more about survival. Because you're fighting as a group of superheroes there's no question of whether you're going to succeed or not. The question is how well and how quickly you can succeed. The system kind of reminded me of Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle where you're sort of rewarded for finishing battles in as few turns as possible. 
Unfortunately, there are a few areas where battles fall short and some improvements could have been made. The arenas are very basic and flat. They usually only consist of a big circle or a square with a few environmental objects that you can interact with. I know the developers have said that obviously the reason there's no cover is it doesn't make for sense for Iron Man or the Hulk to be hiding, but they could have maybe incorporated some kind of verticality into the maps, allowing the superheroes maybe to just fly around a little bit or jump in the case of Hulk. The other, one other criticism is that enemy variety is limited for the first half of the game, and even after this you're still kind of fighting the same grunts over and over again. And the boss fights themselves, there's only a handful of bosses in this game that you fight repeatedly and uh, each time you fight them you have to down them two or sometimes even three times and it starts to feel a little bit repetitive. Ultimately though, the card based battle system in Miles Midnight Suns is really well executed. It's fast, it's relatively easy to get into, but it's complex and deep enough to give you a challenge if you're looking for one. When you've chosen your character combination, worked out synergies and built your decks, Everything comes together on the battlefield and it feels great. Once you understand the system and you're chaining heroes attacks together, you complete battles in one or two, ter two turns, the game makes you feel clever. It makes you feel like you're solving a puzzle. And these are the things that I think any great strategy game needs to do. And Marvel's Midnight Suns does this with flair and style. In order to put your team and deck together, you need to spend time in the other half of this game, the Abbey. The Abbey is literally where you'll spend 50% of your playthrough of Marvel's Midnight Suns, or depending on how much you want to invest into it, even more. It's divided into either daytime or nighttime, which each are set up with different activities for you to do, which either help you in combat or help to flesh out the world and the characters. For example, after battles you earn random card packs which Tony Stark can open for you, each card pack being made up of cards from heroes that you used in the last battle, which means if you want to make your Scarlet Witch stronger, you need to use her in battle. It's a good way to encourage you to experiment with every character. Blade lets you unlock the ability to upgrade your cards through combining duplicates or through adding mods to the cards. Blade also runs the gym where you can spar with other heroes to increase their experience points. As you walk around the abbey you can talk to heroes to learn more about them and at different times in the game they'll have different things to say to you. The developers have said there are over 60,000 lines of dialogue in this game and I'm not surprised. The amount of content is vast and I didn't manage to speak to everyone every time it's possible because on a single playthrough it's actually a bit too much. If you're into Marvel lore and you're interested in some of these characters, this is a great way to get to know them and spend some time with them. Especially some of the more niche characters like Nico or Magic, or even actually Blade. You can really delve into their personalities and you can find out quite a lot of their backstory in kind of Mass Effect style question and answer sessions. In terms of character interaction, there are multiple different types of interaction. There are little quests and scripted events which actually happen spontaneously throughout your playthrough, which flesh out the characters in the world. And you'll sometimes get a text from one of the heroes asking you to come and speak to them. These are scripted events that are quite interesting, especially if you're familiar with the Marvel Universe, but maybe not super well versed in it. You'll get a chance to ask them some questions about their backstories and how they became superheroes, and at the end of it you'll boost your friendship level with that hero. Then at night, after missions, there's the hangout system which is quite obviously taking inspiration from games like Persona and Fire Emblem Three Houses. These hangouts are unfortunately not the most interesting, they're kind of generic, and don't offer much in the way of new information. They can come across as quite juvenile and out of place. Some examples, playing video games with Captain Marvel or fishing with Wolverine. They will have conversations while they're doing it, but it's usually nothing of significance, it's usually something inane. These could have been more interesting and they could have had character specific stories that go throughout the game. You also find random extra moments around the Abbey, things like a book club with Blade, a car workshop with Spider-Man, and there's a pool you can kind of hang out with people in. I must admit, I didn't really go into that, that stuff much during my playthrough, but it's quite cool that it's there. Exploring the Abbey itself is like a whole separate game in itself. There are areas that are gated behind abilities which you need to unlock through combat challenges. The combat challenges are different to the main battles in that you are using one character and they have different objectives. A good example is where using the hunter I had to knock back grunts in a specific way, kind of like crazy golf, to hit the last person into an object. This was really fun. Overall, I enjoyed the exploration. The grounds around the Abbey are well designed and quite pretty to look at. And it's, if you're interested in Marvel lore, then there's quite a lot to explore here. And talking to the heroes and finding more about them is quite good. You end up getting into quite a nice rhythm and a cadence with the kind of, I guess you could call them extracurricular activities. They do end up adding variety to your playthrough. And one of the best things about it is that most of the activities you take part in feel useful in some way. They all kind of contribute to battle. When you talk to someone, you raise your XP with them. When you hang out with someone, you raise your XP with them. When you take someone into battle and you unlock their cards, you can upgrade those cards, you can make them better, you can tailor your decks. Everything that you do in this game kind of leads to the same outcome. The outcome of making your team stronger and progressing the main story.
A quick word on the main story, I'm not going to spoil anything here. It's not the most interesting, it is kind of generic Marvel. However, there are a few twists and turns and it is serviceable enough to sort of carry me through to the end game. Marvel's Midnight Suns is a huge multi-layered game, which as someone who's played lots of strategy games, I really enjoyed. Initially I wasn't planning on playing this as I just finished Mario and Rabbit's Sparks of Hope, so I was kind of looking to play something other than a tactics game, but I thought I'd give this a try. The battles and the card system and the Marvel heroes are kind of what initially drew me into this. At first I wasn't keen on the friend simulator side of the game, but over time I got drawn in by the lore and exploring the abbey and I ended up enjoying nearly every aspect of this game. I ended up finishing it and spending much longer with it than I intended to and I now intend on playing the DLC because I loved it so much and I just want to spend more time with this game.